So welcome everybody, welcome folks in the library and welcome to folks on Zoom. My name is Cynthia Blankenship. I am the president of the Geologists of Jackson Hole and I'm also on the speakers committee. Um, for those in the library, so for those on Zoom, we have about 30 people in the library. It is a phenomenal turnout, <laughs> especially since most people knew that Simeon wouldn't actually even be here in person. So that's wonderful. And could I remind the folks here in the library to turn your phones onto mute, please? So we have Simeon Kasky from Grand Teton National Park. A little bit of a introduction for him. Uh, Simeon was born in Alaska and raised primarily in Michigan. He earned a BS in 20, 2007 from the University of Michigan in environmental science and geology, and his MS in 2013 in geoscience from Colorado State, focusing on fluvial geomorphology. His thesis was on channel morphology and riparian community impacts from diversions in small mountain streams. In 2013, Simeon began his federal career with the U.S. Forest Service as a hydrologist in Laramie, Wyoming, working on stream and riparian restoration in between road and timber sale projects. In 2015, he moved to the Shoshone National Forest in Lander, Wyoming, as a zone hydrologist, and he fell hard for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and its pristine landscapes. So since 2017, Simeon has been the physical science branch chief at Grand Teton National Park and the John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway, overseeing science and resource management for water, air, geologic, and other abiotic resources. In addition, he serves as the GIS lead and ad hoc climate change coordinator. He is responsible for pursuing research, monitoring, management, and restoration of a variety of physical science resources. For the past six and a half years, he has led the Glacier Monitoring and Geohazard slash Rockfall Assessment Program, as well as provided technical expertise on many water resource projects ranging from minor and major stream bank stabilization and construction projects to wild and scenic river flow quantification, floodplain assessments, wetland restoration, flood response, and more. So thank you very much, Simeon, for preparing this talk for us. And I will let you take it away from here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and let me know when you can see it. clear out there. We can see it. Oh my. Now we can't. Okay. I am going to mute my computer now. Um, so you can take it away, Simeon. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Cynthia. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Sounds like a good turnout. But if you'll notice, we added a little bit of flair behind me. And uh, that is actually the curtain uh, in the Teton Library, at least a photo of it. So uh, I'm here to talk with you today about what's happening with our Teton glaciers and 150 years of change. And even though my background is in fluvial geomorphology, I've gotten up to speed uh, working in the Wind Rivers uh, over on the Shoshone and for six and a half years on in Grand Teton. And it's been a really exciting uh, journey. And first of all, I'd just like to really, really give a huge shout out to our partners and contributors because this would, work wouldn't be possible without their uh, extensive help. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is our uh, main financial support for this project and started funding it in 2015. Dan McGrath at CSU has been doing a lot of the research in GPR, ground penetrating radar, we'll show later. And Elizabeth Case, who just uh, defended her PhD at Columbia University and is now postdocing in the Netherlands, uh, did a lot of the work you'll see in here today too. And a big shout out to the physical science staff. I think some of them are sitting in the room right now. Uh, a lot of the content in here and the field work uh, analysis, so much of it has been done by them. Joni Gore, Jared Bath, and Maddie Grubb, Joey Nadeau. And so uh, if you see them, please give them a high five because they're all stars, rock stars. 
Also want to thank Patrick Wright of Inversion Labs, the Scientists in the Park program. And we've gotten funding from the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee as well. And then the Jenny Lake Rangers, who are key to some of our technical alpine work, uh, roping up and navigating around crevasses are really instrumental. And you'll see some photos of them later. And there's been a host of other partners, Utah State, University of Wyoming, USGS, and others I'll mention later in the presentation. So a quick overview of the talk outline. We'll give a quick Glacier 101. Uh, this isn't meant to be in depth, how do glaciers work, but at least a bare minimum of understanding for this presentation. Talk a little bit about climate trends because glaciers are really important indicators of climate change. And that's one of the reasons that we are studying and monitoring them so closely. And then provide some of the context in addition to climate change for why this work is important. And then we'll do a deep dive into some of our methods because I think that that is some of the most interesting aspects of our work. And then of course, what everybody came for, the results. And finally, leading into future work. And this is really going to be built off of and considering what you're going to see here as a foundation for work into the uh, coming years and decades. <clears throat> so there are a lot of different types of glaciers, and this isn't meant to encompass all of them. But what I do want to uh, emphasize is that we're primarily looking at what we call surface glaciers, which are or cirque glaciers, which are in the alpine zone, uh, as opposed to ice field glaciers or tidewater glaciers or Piedmont glaciers or valley glaciers. These cirque glaciers are really tucked up in these cirques uh, and head walls that are protecting them and contributing to a lot of snow deposition and, and can be very variable as we'll talk about later. That being said, we have had valley glaciers and Piedmont glaciers that have existed in the range before, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Although we have not had tidewater glaciers, um, at least that I'm aware of in the, the larger Teton area. So a little bit of a cross section of how uh, alpine glaciers or cirque glaciers work. We've got a perennial snowfield that typically melts away, what's called the ablation zone. And then there's a fern line or an uh, equilibrium line uh, where the ablation zone and the accumulation zone meet. Got permanent snow, uh, neve, fern, uh, new ice, and then glacial ice down below. And oftentimes, where you get uh, the ice, that body that's meeting up with a permanent snowfield up higher or bedrock, in a lot of cases, you'll get a bergschrund or a crack uh, between the wall of a rock face or a cirque and the actual ice or permanent snowpack. And then the path of the glacier is really moving down down slope and oftentimes we'll see some terminal moraines or lateral moraines at the um, uh, terminus of glaciers or on the, the medial or, or sides of the glaciers. And we've got a couple of great examples in the Tetons of Tarn Lakes, uh, such as School Room and uh, Glacier Peak Glacier or Seward Webb Glacier, uh, as some have referred to it. So a little bit of a <clears throat> primer on observed conditions. This is from the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment, uh, Hostetler et al. published it in 2021. And I believe Brian Schumann gave a presentation on it to this group a while back. But basically, this is a summary of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem that uh, from the period from 1950 to 2020, uh, we do see that temperature has risen by, uh, uh, by about 2.3 degrees uh, Fahrenheit at a rate of, um, you know, a third of a degree Fahrenheit. Also, snowfall in general has declined by about three and a half inches per decade. And much of the snowfall decline is uh, occurring in spring when warming is the greatest. And then one of the interesting things is that mean annual precip is staying pretty level and maybe even a little bit of increase in, in some areas this, um, uh, this watershed included. And also another interesting note on uh, figure D down here is the timing of peak stream flow over the past 70 years, you, there's really a demonstrable uh, signal of it coming earlier in the year. And I think it's about six days on average. And so just over the past couple of years too, we've seen that timing of peak stream flow uh, set some uh, set some records uh, for how early it is specifically in some of our lower elevation watersheds like Pacific Creek. 
And the reason I'm sharing this is just because a lot of these things do contribute to how glaciers form and are maintained and uh, whether they continue growing or declining and are moving or become static over time. And then leading into what we've observed uh, and beyond into actual projections out into the future, one of the so what pieces from the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment is really that over the GYE, we're really going to see a decrease in these snow dominant areas. And this graph shows uh, green as rain dominant, uh, yellow, orange, and red as rain snow mix, and then shades of blue as snow dominant. And so essentially on the Y axis, you see uh, elevation. And so what you're seeing on the X axis is over time that uh, more of the lower elevation areas are going to shift from either rain snow mix or snow dominant to uh, a greater degree of uh, precipitation being rain in some form. And so one of the nice things about the greater Yellowstone assessment is that they broke this. It was one of the first uh, first summary papers to really break this down by watershed, which is really helpful as a resource manager to understand how changes are affecting the snake headwaters versus the upper Yellowstone versus the greater Yellowstone as a whole. And so again, also we're expecting to see changes to the timing of snowfall and snow melt. So another so what piece, globally glaciers are projected to lose between 26% to 41% of their mass by 2100. Uh, for varying global uh, temperature change scenarios. And uh, for the two example reasons shown here, that really manifests in widespread deglaciation, and that's noted by the open black circles. And historical simulations um, with near surface air temperature and precip data and future projections uh, were were created using an ensemble of global circulation models. So it's summarizing a lot of different models, not just cherry picking one or a few. But however, for these small glaciers that we're talking about today, it's really imperative that we better understand the mass balance processes that control their existence today and in order to make accurate projections into the future. And drilling down even more so, although our eyes and research activities tend to be drawn to the glaciers shaded in blue, like these really large ones, the, the, uh, the really important fact is that small glaciers constitute a majority of glaciers around the world. And in fact, some 66% of glacier area are uh, glaciers that are less than uh, half a kilometer squared or so. And so that and even more so at glaciers that are less than a kilometer squared are about 80% of the glacial area. So that's more than 200,000 glaciers. And these are real glaciers. They erode their beds, they generate melt water in the late summer, and they uh, provide all the services that we typically attribute to large glaciers, just they're small or very small. And so studying these is essential and that's why we're doing it. And we're not studying them because they're going to contribute significantly to sea level rise necessarily and in each of themselves, but they are important components of these complex alpine ecosystems that we'll talk a little bit more about later. However, the majority of the glaciological field campaigns are focused on these much larger glaciers. And so uh, these glaciers respond more directly to regional climate forcings, and that leaves a real knowledge gap in our understanding of the mass balance processes on these very small glaciers. And just to give you a little bit of insight into what makes these small glaciers unique is that there are really local topographic mass balance drivers that play an outsized role in controlling these glaciers and how they move and um, uh, become static or change over time. And these processes really act to either amplify or reduce a seasonal mass balance component. And therefore they sometimes partially decouple these glaciers from the regional climate. And some of the key processes uh, that uh, lead to that regional, that decoupling are topographic shading, for example, this is middle Teton Glacier, and in the upper reaches are really tucked against this north facing, north facing slope right here where uh, you don't get ever get a lot of sunshine and you can see that um, basically permanent snow that's always res residing there. And then debris cover, you look down at the lower lobe and there is a significant amount of debris cover yet as we'll show later on, there is a, uh, a, a real uh, real significant uh, ice mass underneath of that debris covered lobe of that lower lobe of middle Teton. And then 
right below the lower saddle here in the leeward side of the lower saddle is a lot of wind redistribution. And this is the area where, as I'll show later, we have some of the largest and deepest um, snow, snow depths that are in snow water equivalents of in the snowpack uh, on the entire glacier because of that wind deposit. And then we also have a significant uh, contribution by avalanches that uh, come off the east face of the Middle Teton and funnel down the couloir and then uh, uh, just redistribute snow across the face. And so that makes this a really complex environment to work in and understand and makes it extremely important. Stepping back a little bit, just to give a little context of glaciation in the region, as many of you probably know that the uh, penultimate uh, major glaciation was the Bull Lake glaciation from 170,000 to about 130,000 years ago. And that covered pretty much the entirety of the Jackson Hole Valley. While the margins down here in red are not always super well-defined and we don't really have dating on when the, the, that recession was, there are still the elements that are there uh, on the landscape that uh, are evidence of glaciation. And then about 24,000 years ago, uh, the and back in uh, uh, all the way to 11,700 years ago, at the basically the extent of the last glacial maximum, we had the Pinedale glaciation, and that's outlined in blue and kind of this white transparent area where the Yellowstone ice cap grew over time and, and flowed uh, south uh, to the Teton Range. And uh, and then we also had large um, val or large. Alpine Valley glaciers that were forming uh, in Granite Canyon, Glacier Gulch, Jenny Lake, Brad Bradley Lake, Tiger Lake, uh, creating those um, those Piedmont lakes at the base of the range. And finally, we had a, a little ice age advance that ended around the Industrial Revolution, kind of around when carbon emissions started to rise dramatically. And we uh, think of the current surface glaciers as vestiges of the little ice age glaciers. And I should say before moving on, uh, there is uh, a lot of great information on uh, the Pleistocene glaciation of Jackson Hole in uh, Ken Pierce et al. 2018 USGS publication. And that's where this map is from. And it's a wonderful if you wanna learn about the different lobes and um, uh, dating of the uh, terminal moraines of the Pinedale glaciation and uh, just a lot of fantastic work in there, really interesting. And so this is just a close-up view of the Cascade Canyon glacier that spilled out into Jenny Lake uh, at the um, at, during the uh, Pinedale glaciation. And so this schematic figure really illustrates the timeline that we uh, think of with the uh, glaciers from the Pinedale glaciation. So we have model glacier volume uh, on the y-axis and we have time on the x-axis. And so we ha really have good constraints from the moraine ages uh, when the last deglaciation began, especially you look at the Jenny Lake and other uh, terminal moraines and uh, Ken Pierce and Joe Lachardi did some great work uh, dating those. And so we can really understand when that pro-glacial and transitional period was when we lost a lot of that mass. And we can further constrain that with some of uh, Darren Larson and other others' work from lake sediment data to when those Piedmont lakes became um, had a non-glacial signal in that sediment. And so the assumption is that the model glacier volume became essentially zero until the late Holocene advance, which is that little ice age uh, or starting around 1350 that we referred to. And then uh, the modern deglaciation begins around 1850. And so this... Uh, dotted line goes to about now. And so we're going to talk about this period from about 1960 to today, with a little bit back to 1850. So the 11 remaining glaciers in Grand Teton National Park uh, from uh, south to north, and many of you uh, may, this may look odd to you because this is a little bit of a, a flipped version and, and a shout out to Maddie Grubb, who I think is in the audience there, who uh, used her amazing cartographic skills and uh, geoscience expertise to create this. But we've got Schoolroom Glacier in this very far south, Middle Teton Glacier. Tipe Glacier is kind of tucked in in between Middle and Teton Glacier. Uh, Peterson Glacier over here uh, above Michael Lake, kind of above the North Fork of Garnet Canyon. Falling Ice Glacier, Skillet Glacier, the three triple glaciers, east, middle, and west. 
Anang Glacier, Peak Glacier, or uh, as I've heard it referred to also as Seward Webb Glacier. And so I wanted to share this, uh, this video uh, of a little bit of a uh, zoom through of Mount Moran because it's a really interesting massif where it has five glaciers on it. Uh, we're looking at uh, falling ice and skillet and then kind of panning around to the triple glaciers, which are on that north facing side. And note too that you can also really see um, uh, on the left there underneath Thor Peak, uh, some vestiges of other glaciated areas that may even today still be rock glaciers. And so uh, one of the, the things that we've been doing with some of our work is really developing a lot of different outreach products to be able to kind of share this information. And so this is a kind of a demo version of what we hope to have up on our NPS web National Park Service website at some point. And so you can kind of see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, we're kind of zooming out there, but a little bit of a a little vestige of an old glacier and potentially now a rock glacier. And there's also one kind of um, on the bottom of the view right now, right there, kind of in between Skillet and the East Triple Glacier that you can see has furrows and ridging like rock glaciers do. So uh, that's a, a little plug I'll give for a, a later segment in the presentation. And then below Thor Peak that I mentioned earlier, you can also really see this one that's uh, kind of tucked in there. And this one's pretty visible from Lee Lake too. So if you're ever out there and then finally kind of on the very Western side, uh, I don't remember what this peak is called, but uh, it's um, another kind of rock glacier feature over there. So pretty dynamic, pretty complex system right there on Mount Moran. So uh, just a cool thing I wanted to kind of share with you. And Moving on to monitoring of the glaciers and how we're actually doing it, I uh, really was struck when I came here that there's a really rich history of uh, historical monitoring of these glaciers and these scientists mountaineers uh, have been making these observations while spending time learning and climbing in the mountains and Fritjof Fritzl uh, was widely regarded as the park's first naturalist uh, on the far right there. And he wrote about them in detail and he's got some great prose in some of his books uh, and was also a professor of geology. So if you've never picked one up, it's definitely worthy of a read, especially if you're sitting on the shores of Jenny Lake, taking taking in the views. And on the left here, Fred Ayers uh, took some very important and iconic photos and are some that we really rely on now uh, and have reoccupied in our work to the extent possible. Um, and we don't do uh, nearly as good of a job as uh, some like Mike Marigliano that I'll uh, give a shout out to a little bit later. Uh, but they do provide striking visuals to tell the story of receding glaciers and also allow us to quantify some too what those equilibrium lines are. And then uh, Dr. John Reed was uh, doing surveys in the early 1960s. This is on Teton Glacier with a theodolite and a and a rod, and you can see how much debris cover was on there, but he observed even a slight terminus advance in 1966. And so building off of that, some of our current monitoring methods uh, are detailed here, and this is an image of Middle Teton Glacier with some of our different sites, and it can give you an insight into the variety that we have, but we have time-lapse cameras on Middle Teton uh, Glacier. We've got uh, a time-lapse camera kind of up here to the west. We've got another one uh, down that hits the lower lobe. And then we've got repeat photo points on here. And then we've got one up here kind of below TP Glacier. And this one, this photo point, if I'm not mistaken, is trying to repeat that uh, Ayers photo from the 1930s uh, as closely as we can. And then we've got temperature sensors that are deployed in various locations. And off, this, off the... Uh, map here, we also have stream flow measurements that we've tried to cite in both glaciated and non-glaciated basins to measure the contribution of these uh, ice and uh, perennial snow fields to the um, alpine stream ecosystems. And so these particular uh, measurements are not unique to Middle Teton Glacier. We do them on about uh, six or seven of the glaciers, depending on the metric or the um, specific uh, data we're trying to collect. And um, there are some things that we do on Middle Teton that are 
specific to uh, that glacier because we identified it as kind of the most representative and the second largest, I believe. And it also has probably the best access and some of the um, safest uh, safest terrain to be able to, to look for. So we do a spring survey and I'll go into depth in a little bit more about that later with snow pits, um, ablation sticks and probing, and then a fall geodetic survey with the Jenny Lake Rangers. And so we deploy a lot of these throughout the summer. We try to, some of them are uh, installed year round and some of them we put out in the, uh, the spring. So here's an example of the time-lapse cameras, which are uh, set to collect four images every day from about 11.30 to one from late June through early September. So we, uh, we try to um, get out there as early as possible to deploy them when conditions are safe enough. And then we try to wait till as long as possible. And then we also do repeat photography. Uh, this is falling ice in the middle uh, where we're looking up at the Mount, uh, Mount Moran and the Diabase Dike sticking straight up. And um, there's also some historical photography from this location, uh, which we've tried to repeat as well. And then uh, here's Maddie, uh, who's in the audience again, uh, deploying one of our air temperature sensors. And this uh, temperature network was initially uh, de uh, designed to uh, monitor white bark pine stands. Uh, so we've co-opted that uh, particular protocol for uh, our um, co-located climate sensor network. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we all we also install loggers that collect stream pressure uh, for or or in other words, depth of the water, and it also collects temperature. We also collect stream discharge. We actually go monitor it, at, uh, uh, collect it uh, with a um, with a, uh, a stream discharge measurement device, and we we pair this discharge with the depths to see the seasonal trends seasonal trends in the stream flow and temperature and. As I mentioned earlier, we also compare this to um, try to compare this to non-glaciated basins to identify the differences. But uh, one of the uh, challenges in these basins is that we found that uh, rock glaciers um, are in a lot of places and uh, are significant tribut contributors to meltwater runoff. And so, I, I uh, apologies, I don't know who this is freezing their feet off in the uh, um, this stream. Um, I believe downstream of. Uh, uh, the South Fork of Garnet Canyon, um, but there looks like they're pounding in a um, a little uh, a little bolt to affix the pressure transducer um, in the uh, in the streams. And so, one of the challenges with this glacial stream flow monitoring is that uh, it's actually really hard to find a single thread channel that doesn't have much um, subsurface flow through all this glacial till and other material. And so, we really um, spent multiple years trying to investigate and and try different sites and then to be able to get up and monitor them at different discharges has um has been yeah six years in the in the making and one of the the most exciting parts about our glacier monitoring program in my opinion is the spring survey of the middle teton glacier and so we usually visit at the end of the accumulation season and we have um a cohort of skilled ski mountaineers and snow scientists uh, and we're carrying up over 100 pounds of monitoring equipment. And this on the right is a picture of the stream steam drill and ablation stakes that we uh, put into the snow and ice. We dig a snow pit and collect snow densities. Um, we probe snow depths across the glacier. And so this is actually just kind of a fraction of what we uh, what we have um, uh, to bring up there to do our, um, our monitoring. And we ski everything up there. Uh, every year, um, with the exception of a, a few of the larger items that we um, we do cash on site. And one word of warning, um, in the spring, when you're skiing in shorts, uh, make sure you put suntan lotion on the back of your legs, because it's one of the worst burns that I've ever had in my life. Um, so we use this Hoiki ice drill, which is a light steam drill. Um, and it's made by a, a, a German father and son team, but basically it's just a, a normal camp stove like isopropane, uh, isobutane propane burner at the bottom of this. And then this is just a big pressure tank. And then we shoot pressurized um, steam through this hose. And this is a 13 meter long hose so we can get uh, really deep down. And uh, while no one's been brave enough to test this yet, uh, right in the manual, you can cook your kielbasas on there. So, um, anybody wants to come up with us and try, you're welcome to. So 
So I thought I'd just, hopefully this works, give a little view of the whole, the 11 meter hole is drilled right now. And so these uh, ablation stakes are being put in and they're kind of like tent poles uh, where we have a cord that's affixing them together. You can kind of see, and then this is kind of an oh crap moment where you worry that the ice has uh, actually filled in um, and uh, you can't get your, um, uh, your stake all the way down the 11 meter hole. Fortunately, this ended up, uh, uh, we had success with all five of our ablation stakes this year, but that's kind of the setup on the surface of the glacier. Um, and then we go throughout the season and we do these site visits where we actually uh, look at the, um, the, uh, the ablation stake. Um, it's tip. You can see the, uh, the, stake that Reba's holding is standing straight up. And as they melt out, they fall over. And so got one meter, two meters, three meters, and four meters that have melted. And I think that visit was on July 1st, 2019. And um, you can see that uh, that was probably maybe 30 to 45 days uh, that we lost that four meters of, uh, of snowpack. And then also for Reference, you can see some uh, climbers either uh, probably glissading down from the lower saddle. Um, the winter approach is uh, still in um, on the way up to the Grand Teton. So we also dig snow pits. Um, we've dug them every year starting in 2019. And I believe this is uh, Pete Lynn in the uh, photo here, who is one of the folks who came out on several of our uh, missions from 2019 to 2021, I think. And just for reference, uh, Pete's, um, I don't know, uh, maybe 6'3", if I had to guess. So this uh, snow pit is about 400 cent 450 centimeters or 4.5 meters deep. And we estimated that it was about 150 uh, centimeters or 1.5 meters above the previous summer surface according to our snow probe estimates. And so uh, we, uh, yeah, we um, in, in uh, following years haven't gone nearly as deep uh, because once you get to about two meters deep, your uh, snow densities uh, really, really homogenize. And so therefore we just kind of use a um, an average value uh, um, with estimating the uh, the rest of the snow depth from what we dig on top. Uh, so that's worked out pretty well for us. And then we don't have to bit dig a uh, almost five meter deep hole um, in, in a wet slide avalanche path. And uh, this is a picture from our um, our uh, <laughs> field, field gear uh, hiker trash explosion um, camped out on the moraine next to the middle Teton. Actually, I think it's pretty minimal and, you know, we, we leave no trace, but um, you can see we have a tarp set up and all of our gear laid out, science, camping, uh, cooking gear, all the like. So it's really kind of a, an expedition. I'm proud to say we've been able to do it uh, um, completely uh, human powered um, uh, to this point. And one of the exciting things we've embarked on in the last three years is ground penetrating radar with Dan McGrath pictured here from Colorado State to measure the um, both the snow depth and uh, the ice thickness of the glacier. And uh, Elizabeth Case, as I mentioned earlier, has done a lot of modeling of this these glacial ice depths, and we'll talk about those results later. And so just to give you a sense of what that looks like on a steep glacier. Uh, on the left here is Middle Teton in June, 2023. Uh, it takes a two man team to tow this uh, GPR, ground penetrating radar sled. Uh, one person to kind of lead it in the front and the other to uh, control the tail in the back. It's mounted with high accuracy GPS so you know exactly where you are. Uh, and yeah, it, uh, it, I haven't gotten to be on that crew uh, for better or worse, but apparently it can be pretty exciting, especially on the steeper margins of the glacier up here in that upper right of the photo. And then uh, this is Dan and his team from a, a GPR survey on Teton Glacier uh, this past fall, trying to get a sense of the um, ice thickness as well as the albedo um, on these debris covered um, uh, parts of the glacier. And so this is a pretty interesting photo from Teton Glacier, because you can see there's a lot of ice, uh, but also a ton of debris and then even some uh, glacial snow melt that's going subsurface uh, right on the left side of the photo. And last slide of the monitoring methods, I promise. Uh, the, uh, the other big thing I mentioned we do is a fall geodetic survey with our Jenny Lake Rangers. And 
This is uh, some pretty technical travel because the crevasses are exposed at this time of year. Uh, we perform this at the end of the ablation season, so typically the first weekend uh, of September. Um, and sometimes that can uh, be a little inclement, uh, but we try to collect the glacier surface elevation by using high accuracy GPS um, on a survey rod. Um, and we follow a predetermined grid that we do and repeat every year. And we used to outline the glacier terminus, but um, it's become really uh, difficult to identify the edge of the glacier. And I'll talk about that in a moment here, why. And so finally, what you've all been waiting for is some of the results. And so this is another image of how we're collecting that GPS data. Um, and we actually use that uh, that hitched sling to attach this to a harness so that you, when you're walking around, the survey rod doesn't trip you up because it's definitely crampons only travel. And then uh, on the right, um, here's Reba excited to be done with a uh, field day. And that's just at the top of the fixed lines on the lower saddle after we got what felt like a half inch of rain while we were sitting on the glacier surface. And I mentioned the repeat photo comparison. And so just notice the difference in um, just over 40 years from the ice margin going all the way to the uh, uh, Tarn Lake uh, below schoolroom glacier and then in 2015 um, receding all of that way. And so uh, again, uh, big shout out to um, Mike Marigliano who gave a presentation in early 2022 with his um, very, very uh, high um, uh, high integrity, high quality repeat photo comparison. Um, go check out that presentation. Um, it's really good and uh, does a lot, uh, does a lot of uh, um, really interesting uh, uh, discussion of how he's um, been able to get to a lot of these locations and some of the things that go into making a really high quality repeat photo. And so we try to do this, um, you know, more for uh, just having a photo every year and not being as um, as exact with the time of day and the the time of the year, but just trying to get something, especially since it can be so interesting for not only quantifying potentially, but also just for um, outreach materials and sharing with the public and just really being a strong visual. And so this is a, an image from our time lapse camera showing the snow melt from. Uh, late June to early September on Middle Teton Glacier. And so you can really see that uh, 2021 was actually a really big snow melt year or a really big uh, glacial melt year. And you can actually see some of the um, late season snowstorms that were coming in. And so then it's looping back to the beginning. So the bottom right has that date. But you can see it's pretty powerful and it allows us to be able to look year by year and see how um, different uh, years stack up uh, to different um, other metrics that we have. And so one of the ablation, one of the nice things about the ablation stakes is that we can actually derive velocities from this. And so uh, our upper stake on the middle Teton Glacier, and so this is kind of looking east, you can see, I think that's, um, I want to say that's Taggart in the um, upper left, either Bradley or Taggart, I can't quite tell, but um, that's uh, our uppermost stake, and that's moving at about 5.4 meters per year. Uh, the middle stake, where we um, have the most vo highest velocity, is about 6.7 meters per year, and uh, our lower stake is about five meters per year. So we got a little bit lower velocity on that lower stake, but you can see they're all um, pretty close, and they average to about six. We've got a couple other ablation stakes that I didn't include on this visual, but. Um, you know, these were really estimated from uh, stake displacement over time. And so we have found some of the original stakes that we've put in in 2019 um, in, uh, I think, as late as 2022 or maybe even 2023. So we've been able to measure these over the course of um, some of them over the course of three to four years. And so uh, we we really feel like pretty strongly in how uh, those results bear out. And so shifting a little bit into the change in area of these, we had uh, five grand, five glaciers in the Tetons that had significant geomorphological indicators, which essentially just means a distinct terminal moraine and trim lines um, and or lateral moraines to be able to reconstruct the Little Ice Age extent. And that's what's in the dark blue. And so again, remember that's uh, about 1850 or so when that recession started. And so that's why 
We're saying this is um, what's happened over the past 150 years. So on those five glaciers, West and Middle Triple, Glacier Peak, Teton, and Schoolroom, uh, you can see that West and Middle Triple, uh, 87, 74% change in area. And again, this is over the course of, actually maybe it's about 170 years, potentially, depending on when the timing of the um, little ice age recession was. 92% of Glacier Peak or Seward Webb Glacier, 64% of Teton, and 83% uh, of school room. And pivoting to a little bit more recent history, uh, Elizabeth Case did an analysis um, looking at uh, um, historical uh, aerial imagery and deriving DEMs from that from as early as 1954, but some of them are from 1967. And this is a time series of the glacier area change between those two dates uh, from aerial and satellite imagery. Um, and the plot colors in row indicate the size of the starting area with the smallest starting area in the blue at the top and the largest in purple at the bottom. Um, or I'm sorry, I. Uh, I was mistaken. The um, the light blue is the current 2022 area, and then the gray is the 1954-1967 area. And so um, the 1954-1967, uh, um, some of the uh, 1954 imagery wasn't available, and that's noted by an asterisk right here and um, for falling ice in East Triple. Um, and note there are actually a 14 uh, here total rather than the 11 I referred to at the beginning. And the 14 is because when Elizabeth went back and looked at the 1954-1967 imagery, she uh, she actually noted that North 2, as she named it, North 1, and uh, what was it, ice flow, were both larger than uh, 0.1 square kilometers. And so she included those in uh, this as uh, potential for glaciers that have uh, since disappeared just in the past uh, 70 years. And uh, just so you know, the mean glacier change across all of these glaciers was about 60%. So over the course of that, uh, that uh, 60 or so years, the mean glacier change was about 60% plus uh, decrease plus or minus 5%. And so, Shifting a little bit again to look at change in elevation, we have a geodetic survey that we did that I mentioned earlier. And so we've done that on Middle Teton since 2015. And we can see that there's uh, a lot of ice loss um, on the order of uh, up to about four and a half, uh, five meters in some areas. And this is uh, pretty significant ice loss, we would uh, say. And then another way to look at this uh, is a change in, a change in elevation based on LIDAR. And so this is Glacier Peak Glacier, Seward Webb Glacier. And we had LIDAR flown, which is high resolution um, uh, light information detection and ranging. Uh, and that um, actually provides these really high resolution digital elevation models. And we get uh, four points per square meter and uh, resolutions of um, or accuracies of plus or minus um, like, you know, a few centimeters um, in the vertical. And so we can, we had a repeat uh, flight flown in 2022. And so this is essentially a differencing of those two digital elevation models. And so the mean elevation surface change for Glacier Peak Glacier over the course of that eight years was about eight meters. And you can see some of this area over here actually saw um, upwards of 20 meters of loss. Um, and then one thing important to note with these LIDAR differencing is that the um, some of this area is covered by seasonal snow. So this isn't just ice loss. This can be a difference between uh, snow cover as well. And then the Teton Glacier, uh, similarly, um, a little bit less uh, significant, but saw a mean elevation surface change of about five meters. And uh, the white line around the perimeter delineates a 2022 visible ice extent. Um, and you can see so there are some interesting patterns going on here. Uh, up in the crevasses, you can see there's actually some areas of growth. So we attribute that to crevasses potentially shifting. And uh, right below the uh, kind of ice fall or crevasse uh, zone, um, a really big loss area, even a little area of growth that um, this is very preliminary. So we're still kind of looking into uh, what's driving some of this. Um, and then another big area of loss down near the uh, lower lobe. And then 
some areas outside of the ice extent, uh, potentially due to accumulation of uh, fine glacial flower and um, you know ponding of material, actually even some um, uh, some accumulation of sediment um, or uh, elevation uh, increase there. And so some interesting things to um, dive into. And finally, looking at Middle Teton Glacier, we see a uh, mean elevation surface change over that eight years of about uh, 4.3 meters of loss. Um, and you can see again, some spatial patterns up in the crevasses, some areas with uh, movement in the uh, crevasses, but overall a lot of loss, especially here in the, um, uh, in the lower margin and then as well, right below the lower saddle. And one of the things that I find the most striking about this image or this um, this differencing is note that the 2022 visible ice extent um, goes to about here. But this, for any of uh, you who have been up in uh, the, the moraines camping zone below the lower saddle next to Middle Teton Glacier, this is all debris and what you would think of as a medial moraine or glacial till potentially. But this uh, across its swath has actually seen a loss of like one to three meters in various parts. And there is no, absolutely no visible ice over there. And so it was really interesting finding because we've hypothesized that there's probably ice that extends all the way over to the edge of um, basically the south, uh, uh, south face of the Grand Teton where it kind of meets the valley and uh, this North Fork of Garnet Canyon. Uh, but this is really striking in that it um, tells a very significant picture that there's even probably some movement down here potentially um, in that what we thought of as moraine and that there's potentially ice all the way across that valley. And so uh, the evolution of glaciers is complex and there's a lot going on and potentially a lot more ice than we have uh, we have understood in the past. And so uh, go, looking at some of these ice loss comparisons and looking at a year-to-year -year basis, uh, our upper snake um, in 2019 had snow that persisted throughout the year. And then in 2021, we actually saw about three meters of water equivalent ice loss. And so uh, different years can impact the, the glacier in really significant ways. And that's one of the important reasons we look, we study, we monitor this annually. In stake D, where it's often melted out in 2019, which was a big snow year and it didn't melt off um, until uh, until late, we had only 1.93, but we had almost um, almost four times that uh, in 2021, which was a big big melt year, which 7.7 .7 meters of water equivalent ice loss. And then stake B, the lower one, we had snow that persisted all the way through 2019, and in 2021 we had three meters of water equivalent ice loss. And so different years can really drive the dynamics of this glacier. And just to paint that picture a little bit more. On the left, uh, we have Sentinel-2 natural color images from the end of the summer for 2019 through 2022. And the seasonal snow appears in bright white. And what I want you to see in the, uh, is that the seasonal snow in bright white versus the glacial ice is a dark blue. It's a lot more extensive in 2019 um, than it is in 2021, for example. And so this bears out in some of our repeat photos. And this is kind of, I think, from uh, that near that Ayers, uh, Fred Ayers um, uh, photo point. But you can see in 2019, there's a lot of snow cover on this lower lobe and all through this kind of Western extent. And there's a melty spot in the middle. But then basically um, in 2021 and the lighting's kind of bad, but you can see how much more ice is exposed um, throughout the entirety of the, almost the entirety of the glacier surface. And so to tie a bow on that one, just to know that one of the things we're trying to do is be able to use this remote sensing uh, information to uh, better characterize uh, snow um, and ice loss over the course of the year. Moving on to snow depths with the ground penetrating radar and, and our snow probing. Um, these are the measured snow depths on Middle Teton Glacier. And uh, the mean snow depth in 2023 was about 4.32 meters uh, with a minimum of about uh, a quarter of a meter and a maximum of 11 meters of snow. And so 2023 wasn't necessarily a, a huge year. Uh, if you remember, I think we had 100% snow water equivalent. There was 11 meters of snow and that occurred um, kind of right below the lower saddle where we have that uh, wind, uh, a lot of wind deposition, that lee side of 
the lower saddle and then um, also in some of the highest elevations uh, elevations surveyed. And so um, these are just showing three years of um, the survey. And this is just showing that we actually calibrated our snow probe measurements to the ground penetrating radar. And so basically what in 2022, as we refined our methods, um, we're able to get a really high correlation between our snow probe depths and our GPR depths. And for those of you that have worked with GPR data, um, I haven't much, but um, what I'll say is that uh, reading those signals can be really tricky. And so where you're able to calibrate with in situ or uh, direct measurements is really important. And that's how we did that. And that also um, allowed us to actually uh, uh, derive snow water equivalent from these um, from these GPR lines. And so that's the track that the team took with that big sled. Um, and some of this is 35 degrees. And so just think about how that might be to ski down 35 degrees towing a, a sled. And um, so SWE really varied between a maximum of uh, 5.3 meters of water equivalent. You can see that um, in, in the very high reaches or kind of below the lower saddle, we see some of those. Um, and then um, uh, also had a minimum of about a tenth of a meter of water equivalent in SWE. And so one of the reasons that we um, we measure that, as I mentioned earlier, is that we have a variety of different processes that are distributing snow across this glacier. And it's really important to have those estimates because it is highly spatially variable. And this was a wet slide we uh, observed this past spring uh, when we were up there doing our survey. And so I'm just showing an example of these because they're key in re redistributing that snow mass from the upper faces of Middle Teton and East Face to, um, down onto the um, down onto the surface. And so here you can see in late May of 2020, you can see it's almost like an alluvial fan where you just get the Kular and the East Face just dumping out all of this um, uh, uh, this wet material and then coming down on the face. And you can kind of see in the middle here that these are the skiers and at one of our um, snow pits or ablation stake sites. And so tying this up, why is the SWE important and why is it to understand it? You know, in all cases, we, we have in the field, we find that the field observed SWE estimates in these high elevation, very small glaciers actually exceed the modeled and observed estimates uh, from uh, measurements like snow tell or um, uh, extrapolation uh, data sets like PRISM or ERA5. Uh, and so, um, you know, in general, like they're close, but the actual estimates we found uh, compared to the closest snow tell, which I believe is Grand Targi, are um, about 127% greater. Or if you used a, a PRISM data set, like you would be underestimating um, the amount of snow in these areas by a third. And so that's emphasizing why it's extremely important to actually get quantitative information on these very small glaciers. So finally, uh, or uh, not quite finally, but what did we find for ice thickness? So this is the GPR results. The ice thickness is um, zero is uh, uh, blue and yellow up to yellow is uh, 60 meters. Um, typically the ice was measured to be about 40 meters thick along the center line. And so you can see that this kind of track right here is the center line uh, of the glacier. And the steeper uh, glacier trunk and uh, also has about 40, but the it thickens to about 50 to 60 meters down glacier. So actually in this lower lobe, uh, which butts right up against this moraine, which is higher than it, um, where the slope decreases, uh, we actually see 50 to 60 meter depth, uh, ice thickness as, um, uh, as measured by the ground penetrating radar. And so the observ observations of the thicker ice in the ablation zone is, is actually supported by the visual observations from the end of the season in um, 2021 and 2022, when we actually observed some really deep moulins um, on the northeast side of the glacier, kind of um, kind of over to the right in this shadow, and really close to the lateral moraine. I mean, almost butting up against it, um, and it almost and it's near where it becomes totally debris covered, and so it's really validating to see uh, all of these things kind of coming together to support. Uh, uh, what we think of as ice being underneath of that whole valley width. Well, so uh, what is so what? So how long does Middle Teton have? Uh, 
we saw depths up to 60 meters. We uh, saw a center line depth of around 40 meters. Uh, from the 2014 to 2022 uh, 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 LIDAR differencing, we saw about maybe um, two thirds of a meter per year of uh, average loss. From 1956 to 2014, we saw about a tenth of a meter a year. So there's obviously um, not a linear rate of change that's going on. And as is evidenced by a lot of the different complexities um, with snow distribution and topographic shading and other things going on uh, with these very small glaciers tucked up into their cirques. But if you look at one of those rates of loss, so if it's more like the last eight years, if you apply it to that 40 meters, could be something like 70 years that we might not see Middle Teton anymore. Uh, or if it's more like 1956 to 2014, maybe it could be 400 years. So there's uh, a lot of, um, and I say these uh, with a very, very large asterisk because this is applying a linear uh, uh, average rate of change to a very uh, nonlinear system and uh, nonlinear processes. And so uh, I say that and take it with a grain of salt because um, you can say with either of those, they're gonna be wrong. <laughs> and also at what point, even if uh, there's still ice there, at what point does it not have enough mass to move under its own power? So is it still a glacier anymore? Uh, those are all uh, really important questions and uh, some of the things we'll be looking at into the future. And so to uh, pivot a little bit, one of the things that we've that's come out from a lot of this uh, study is the importance of rock glaciers. And this is a picture on the northeast side of Doan Peak right here, uh, or maybe right here. And you can see these ridges and furrows uh, that is evidence of ice underneath of that, um, that debris covered surface. And so we can see that uh, in this picture, the Dartmouth Basin rock glacier. Um, here you can see the visual aerial imagery on the left, and then you can actually see the surface elevation change uh, on the right. And so blue is growth and red is loss uh, or orange and red or loss. And so what you can see is that this rock glacier is moving. And so that is one of the things that defines these, um, whether they're active or not, um, based on the International Permafrost Association uh, kinematic velocity uh, guidelines. And um, and then another example is the Gusher Rock Glacier, which is in uh, Paintbrush Canyon. And so you can see that there's a lot of movement in areas of growth and areas of loss. And so those are those ridges and furrows, uh, those transverse um, uh, elements moving down slope or up or not, not moving up slope, but moving down slope. And one of the interesting things I, uh, that really uh, came out of this um, uh, recent analysis that we've done is well, what is the quantitative difference between rock glaciers? Well, based on a rock glacier inventory, there's about 33 of them that were defined to have movement. Um, there's only about 13 active surface glaciers with active movement based on that LIDAR differencing. The mean elevation of the rock glaciers is actually a, about 200 meters lower than the mean, mean elevation of the surface glaciers. Um, the mean surface change, uh, um, just in elevation, it was about half a meter um, of the rock glaciers, but it was about almost six meters for the surface glaciers. The volumetric loss was about 50,000 uh, meters cubed uh, for the rock glaciers. It was about 8 million cubic meters for the surface glaciers from this period of um, across eight years. And um, thanks, Maddie, for summarizing this in school buses. It's a great way to think about it, but it's about 1,800 school buses for the rock glaciers and about uh, almost 300,000 for the surface glaciers. And so these are very preliminary numbers. Um, some of this includes uh, um, seasonal snow. And so there can be differences in the depth of seasonal snow between year to year, obviously. Um, but also one of, the, one of the key takeaways for me too is that the area... Uh, of the rock glaciers is actually 2.6 square kilometers versus about 1.5 total for the surface glaciers. And so what does that mean for the amount of ice under the rock glaciers? Um, we don't know. Um, so uh, more to come in um, relating to the future of glaciers in Grand Teton. Uh, there's a lot to be um, a lot to be discovered, especially moving into rock glacier work. 
Uh, we want to continue our monitoring program. We're going to install, we installed a cyclops camera, which is a year round camera on Middle Teton Glacier to um, help calculate glacial velocity and look at that snow distribution um, throughout the winter period when a lot of it's happening. And so excited to share more of that. And we just put it up last spring and fingers crossed that uh, um, it stays uh, up through this winter because uh, it is in, you know, at 11,400 feet and right below the lower saddle. And we're, um, we're actively coordinating with the Teton Alpine Stream Research Team, uh, who is studying Lednia Teutonica and other um, uh, glacial, or not glacial, but alpine macroinvertebrates and alpine stream habitat and water quality. And they've been doing so for the past decade. And this is a, um, an image of some of their, their sites across the range. And so linking this um, glacial ice loss, rock glacial ice loss to uh, downstream uh, habitat and macro invertebrates in these alpine systems is critical uh, to being able to understand what what change what impacts changing in the system is going to have. And then finally, I wanted to uh, wrap up with some um, some of the work that uh, uh, Dan McGrath, Darren Larson, and Leif Anderson are um, forwarding on the evolution of rock glaciers uh, or evolution of uh, glaciers um, over time taking albedo measurements from Teton Glacier, uh, looking at um, surface albedo because it's a key component of that surface energy balance. So if we're gonna project forward, we really need to understand what that surface energy balance is and how much energy is available for melt. And that differs based on the albedo. And so you can see in the upper left where it's mostly snow, uh, there's um, uh, you know a much, uh, much higher albedo than down lower where we saw some of those photos where it's almost entirely de debris covered and it's a lot lower albedo. And so being able to model ice loss into the future is um, it's incumbent to be able to understand how the radiation and uh, the um, absorption of that um, energy is going to happen across the surface of the glacier. And so back to this timeline in the beginning, so coming full circle, we're here at this dotted line on the vertical where modern deglaciation begins and we're kind of in the middle of it. And we're transitioning from cert glaciers to deglaciation. And so this should be more of a dotted line, um, maybe, but how does this line look? And so that's exactly what um, the team uh, I just mentioned, uh, McGrath, Larson, and Anderson, are going to be doing to um, use high resolution evolution models to simulate glaciers from the last glacial maximum to um, about 2100. And so uh, they're um, hoping to do this um, using constraints based on the lake sediment, um, moraine dating, as well as um, refining model simulations. And then obviously um, all of this glacial data that we just uh, we just described. And so uh, what are some key takeaways? So, so what? Uh, <laughs> wrapping this all in a nice bow. Uh, from 1991 to 2010, Marzion et al. found that 69% of uh, global ice loss can be attributed to anthropogenic influences. Um, in Grand Teton National Park, we observed and measured continual ice loss through the end of the Little Ice Age, uh, from the end of the Little Ice Age, excuse me, uh, about two thirds of a meter of a year average ice loss uh, between 2014 and 2022. Schoolroom TP, Peterson and East Triple may not fit the definition of glaciers anymore, uh, depending on how you look at it and what definition you use, of which there are many. Ice velocities on Middle Teton um, are six meters per year. Uh, and we've seen a, uh, um, a mean annual loss or mean average loss of 60% of our glacier area since uh, 1954, 1967. And uh, one of the things we're trying to get at uh, compared to the Wind River Range, for example, is that glaciers in Bull Lake Creek watershed are contributing 55% uh, of stream flow in late summer um, to uh, these um, large, uh, large rivers downstream. And so they're a disproportionate amount of the, um, of the runoff and the contribution of uh, late season base flows. In the Rocky Mountains, Dan McGrath uh, observed stream temperatures two, degree, two to three degrees uh, Celsius warmer in non-glaciated basins in dry years. So these are really helping um, uh, keep the water temperatures and the uh, water quality in these alpine systems um, at a really, really high level. So we really need to project the future changes based on these drivers. And that's some of the things we're gonna to continue to do. And um, 
wrapping up, I just wanted to say this work wouldn't be possible without the continued support and assistance and expertise of our partners, the foundation. Um, thank you for funding us and making this uh, making this happen. Uh, Dan at CSU, um, Elizabeth, um, formerly at Columbia, now in the Netherlands, and uh, Maddie, Joni, Jared, and Joey, who have been through um, uh, several or uh, a half a decade of seasons uh, sampling and analyzing this data. And so with that, I will um, thank you all for attending and uh, went a little longer than I, th I thought and open it up for questions. Well, thank you, Simeon. You got a big applause here in the library. I don't know if you could hear that. I think you were still muted, so I didn't. So if you could just do it again, that would be great. <laughs> All right, let's do that just once kidding. more. No, again. no, no, it's fine. Everybody's blurry. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, right. Sorry, I blurred the background. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions from, uh, from here, I'll repeat them for the Zoom audience and for Simeon. Um, or Simeon, you may have some questions in chat. I've got, I think, one so far. Okay, I got one here. Yeah, I'd like to include it correctly that the rock glaciers may survive longer than surface glaciers, stay roughly more slowly because they're protected. So the question was, um, is, it, is it fair to conclude that the rock glaciers are melting more slowly than the surface glaciers because they are protected or armored in some way? I think that's a, a, a fair um, ass assessment um, that that debris cover uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and I'm... I, start off by saying this, I'm not a rock glacier expert, but from what I do understand is that uh, a lot of these debris covered, or the debris cover can really um, insulate the, the rock glaciers. And um, there's a, a paper um, from 2020. And, and I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I find particularly interesting, although we don't know how deep the ice is in um, a lot of these rock glaciers or how extensive it is, uh, the diff just the the preliminary differencing that we did from the lidar, uh, showing that there was only half meter of average change over those eight years versus almost six meters on the surface glaciers is really telling. That um, you know if the hypothetically if there's a lot of ice under there, even a decent amount of ice, it's melting a lot slower. And so, just based on physics, yeah, I would say that. Uh, it makes sense to me that if you have a thick enough layer of that debris cover, as well as the difference it makes with, um, uh, or, uh, there's, uh, there's also the albedo piece, but if you get, after you get a certain thickness and it's not a mix of debris covered with the, um, with the ice, it probably insulates versus, um, um, driving more, more melt. Um, and what I'll mention is just in 2021, I think it was uh, Darren Larson uh, published uh, a paper on um, uh, some paleo sedimentology work that he did in uh, Delta Lake and uh, Surprise and Amphitheater Lake, or uh, Amphitheater Lake. Yeah, not Surpri Surprise Lake. Um, it's one or the other, but basically, uh, um, you know, now non glaciated lake versus a glaciated a lake that has glacial input. And one of the things that he found from uh delta lake which um has teton glacier contributing to it is that uh the the glacial flower the glacial signature um is present all the way from the last, last glacial maximum to today uh whereas um in amphitheater lake it it isn't and so the um you know the i think the speculation or the um the uh hypothesis there is that yeah, it may not have been a surface glacier anymore, but did it evolve into a rock glacier that was more protected um, and it was still scouring the bedrock and uh, transporting glacial uh, glacial silt or glacial flower downstream? And one of the most interesting things, or one of the very interesting things about that paper is just that, um, you know, he cored, I think, 
12 meters of sediment in Delta Lake versus about three meters of sediment in amphitheater. So glaciated versus non-glaciated. And then looking at the analysis he did on the sediment is also really, really clear that they're very different. Not only just there's a lot more sediment, it's obviously glacial in origin. Thank you. Any any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Okay, let me let me let me try this. <laughs> the question has to do with how glaciers melt and the the runoff of the glaciers, and then so how how does the runoff compare to the size of the glacier, and then also how does that compare to how much seasonal snowpack we have? Yeah. Something like that. Could you hear that, Simeon? Probably not. I I kind of heard caught it in bits and pieces. So Sorry. I think I think the question really relates to how is 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 how much of a uh, summer runoff is contrib is a contribution from glaciers, something like that. And I think is that what the fifty five or so percent you showed? Yeah, yeah. So that's from the Wind Rivers, based on some isotopic analysis that was done. Um, moving progressively downstream to my understanding, isolate the what water was from glacial melt versus um, groundwater, for example, where or um, other types of snow melt. And so in the Wind River uh, watershed, um, you know, probably like 20 miles downstream of the glacier too, I believe, right above where uh, it might even be Bull Lake Creek uh, meets with um, the Wind River. Um, coming out of kind of that Dinwoody Basin um, or, you know, below Gannett Glacier. It was about 55% of late summer flow was um, was directly attributed to uh, that glacial um, that glacial input. And so uh, we don't have that level of um, uh, quantitative uh, analysis for, for our glaciers yet. And that's one of the reasons that we are monitoring glacial runoff and trying to um, trying to get at that to see what that contribution is for the Tetons, for example. Um, and uh, I think I heard a little bit more of that. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the reasons that that's so important is that, you know, without these uh, elements of the cryosphere or uh, ice bodies or permanent snow fields, uh, most of the other uh, contributors uh, or inputs to late season base flow have really uh, have really started to um, started to decrease significantly. And so uh, those areas where we have groundwater input, um, you know, base that's contributing to base flow are, you know, that just tapers off more and more throughout the year because they're not the infiltration from uh, rain and seasonal snow melt runoff. In, in this part of the world um, really drives that is, um, you know, is, it's not, um, it's not being recharged essentially like that throughout, throughout the uh, summer. And so it makes it critical, especially in a changing climate to know and understand, well, are these glaciated basins supporting more of these, um, you know, alpine, uh, alpine mac stream macro invertebrates that are, um, you know, sometimes endemic to these areas. 
So sorry if I didn't get all of that or answer the question, but if you, if you chat me or email me later, I'd be happy to um, do a more in-depth answer um, if I missed some of that. All right. Do you have any questions on chat there? Yeah, I, I have a couple. Okay. Um, one from Mike Marigliano. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, this is a really good point. And I, I didn't think to mention, I have mentioned this in the presentation or on that slide in the past. Um, but yeah, Jack Reed measured the Teton Glacier's thickness in the mid-1960s to be about 45 to 60 feet. And this is about two thirds of the way down from the top. And do I think this was an underestimate? Um, you know, I think that it probably was an underestimate based on some of the results we've been getting out of Middle Teton Glacier with um, being, you know, upwards of like, you know, 40 to at max 60 meters in depth as opposed to, you know, 20 meters in depth. Um, that being said, we don't have ice thickness results from uh, ground penetrating radar yet for Middle Teton. Uh, I think we might be getting some of that through uh, uh, Dan McGrath's uh, field work uh, outing from this past fall on Teton Glacier, but I'm I'm not I'm not entirely sure. And one of the you know one of the things that Elizabeth did was she actually modeled the glacier depth for all of uh, Teton's glaciers. Um, and so this slab model that she used um, wasn't perfect compared to the GPR for Middle Teton. That's the only uh, actual data we have to be able to constrain it. But it it did a pretty good job um, of um, at least getting rough characterizations. And even in the middle of Teton Glacier, it was definitely more like 30, 40 meters of thickness as opposed to, you know, 15 or 20 that Jack Reed measured. And one of the other things that I read that paper, Mike, and um, Jack Reed, I think he found a moulin or a, a crevasse, and I think he lowered some heavy piece of steel or something down on a rope, and that's kind of how he measured it. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, that's what they had at the time. I mean, there's not, you know, there, I don't think there was ground penetration radar back then, um, but, you know, you could see a lot of, um, you know, potential um, uh, confounding uh variables that might have prevented that um, type of measurement that he did from reaching the true depth of the ice if it hit a, you know, if the crevasse ended, but there was still ice or, you know, I, I don't know the details of how he did it, but that's my understanding. So um, the other question I got was, do you want me to, do you want to, there's only one more question, Cynthia. I don't know if you want to kick okay. back to the room here. Uh, so the next question was, how do you integrate annual snowfall and temperatures with glacier growth and recession? Uh, so that's one of our big next steps to being able to do, uh, to being able to um, project uh, the evolution of Middle Teton and Teton glaciers, for example. And so we've um, we've tried to do this very in a very simple way with. Um, um, just using those two variables and looking at uh, glacial growth and recession, uh, but 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 because of the the variety of mass balance drivers, the um, with these cirque glaciers and these very small glaciers like uh, wind redep wind deposition, um, re redistribution by avalanches, uh, topographic shading, uh, it's been really um, you know, we haven't had good. Uh, good correlation between just integrating the annual snowfall temperatures with the glacier growth and recession. Um, so that's one of the things that that group will be doing to um, look at the evolution and um, not to put them on the spot, but hopefully um, a future presentation down the line um, uh, to that effect. And there's actually a really good paper um, out of Glacier National Park by Caitlin Florentine on the Sperry Glacier where she takes into account some of those um, more complex variables and integrates with snowfall and temperatures. And so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, we're, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Any other questions from the, the library? Okay. Come on over here then. <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I guess I'm just wondering if, um, You've seen any evidence if we have more kind of rain on snow events, that kind of thing. Seen any evidence of like lubrication or anything like that that would cause a, a glacier to um, 
advance in some kind of significant way and how that might affect, you know, ice thickness and things like that. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, uh, so, Ray, hey, Ray, so let me, uh, Simi, let me just make sure everybody here. Oh, sorry. That. Yeah. Did everybody hear that it was about um, rain on ice? Rain on snow. Or rain yeah. on snow. Okay. Rain on ice. All right, go ahead. Yes, Simeon. Um. So yeah, rain on snow events and um, lubrication. I, it is uh, one of the pictures that I showed at the start of the results section with Reba at the top of the um, fixed rope, so right below the lower saddle, we had probably gotten what I felt like was a half an inch of rain and we were just soaked to the bone. And anyways, uh, we went back the next day um, to look at the ablation stakes and it was like, well, we measured them before it started raining and 24 hours later after it stopped raining, uh, Reba was like, no way, there's no change. Like, and I was like, I don't know, it rained a lot. Like, I think it could be. And uh, we actually saw about, um, I don't know, 40 centimeters of ice melt from that rain on snow event. And wow. I, I don't, I, I think it ended up being probably about a half an inch of rain total over that 24 hours. And so I was actually, I thought it would be like maybe 10 centimeters or five or something. And to see 40 was to me pretty shocking. Um, uh, but I mean, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that rain on snow event was atypical than what you see with monsoonal moisture in the summer, um, you know, just convective thunderstorms that park on top of an area. But um, the, the actual answer to your question is uh, anecdotally, um, you know, I could see how rain on snow events uh, would drive lubrication. I think that, um, you know, observation, even anecdotally, I haven't necessarily seen any evidence of that and not something we've seen um, bear out in any quantitative data either. Um, but I will say with those ablation stakes and measuring them over time, one of the things that we could do is start to look at, because uh, we try to hit them um, monthly or every 45 days uh, during the um, ablation season after they're installed. And so we could look at um, rates of change over over time with the glacial velocities. So there could be the potential to investigate questions like that with some of the data we have and comparing it to a local weather station where we have precipitation data. So yeah, it's an interesting question. I never thought of it. Thanks for that. Anybody else here in the library? Mm -hmm. How many glaciers are there in the Wind Rivers? The so question was how many uh, glaciers in the Wind River and Beartooth ranges, if you know. Um, oh gosh, the last, the Wind Rivers, so the interesting factoid, uh, the Wind Rivers um, have a ton of ice, as I'm sure a lot of you know, but it's in the, um, in the uh, United States Rockies, it's definitely, it's by far the largest, um, volume and area of ice by, by like a lot, um, is the wind river, like in the wind rivers compared to glacier, Beartooth, Tetons, Southern, you know, Colorado Rockies. So, um, the wind rivers, like, you know, I don't know how this figures, but the Tetons pale in comparison just to the amount of ice. But, uh, one of the things Tetons have is a lot um, easier access and uh, a lot of the same drivers, at least on the smaller glaciers. But I want to say there are like something like 70 plus um, larger than a tenth of a kilometer in the winds. Um, and some of them are really big. I mean, compared to what we're looking at in the Tetons, not necessarily compared to like, you know, Alaska. But um, the uh, Beartooths, uh, this was about six years ago, I believe they had four identified, but I think that many of them sort of like our Peterson Glacier had maybe evolved into more um, potentially rock glaciers as opposed to surface glaciers. And so I think it's maybe just one or two that are surface glaciers that are still what we might, what we would probably define as, as glaciers, but don't, don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere in that magnitude. And I don't know exactly where they're at now, but yeah, like four in the bear twos. All right, then I think um, we don't have many more questions here from the library. Any any uh, 
last minute ones on chat? I'll just say, um, if Joni and Jared and Maddie are still there, ask them your questions afterwards. If... <laughs> they are, they're still here. So uh, we'll, we'll fire away at them. So uh, thank you very much, Simeon. That was, that was fabulous. And thank you for doing this over Zoom. I think it worked reasonably well. Um, so well, let's give Simeon another hand and I'll. Sorry, I couldn't be there with y'all. Thanks for having me.